Hello and welcome to Common Rider Black Man. If you're reading the title Blow Me on YouTube, then you know that today we are heading back to the Showa era, which is something that I've been planning to do for a while now. Why? Because for the most part, I'm pretty curious about it. Just because something is old doesn't mean it's good. It started back to when I reviewed and looked at Kamen Rider Black, and since then, I was a bit curious at watching a bit more of the Showa era. I've seen bits of its sequel, Black RX, and for, uh, for as far as I know, there are very few little hits and misses on my radar for what I've seen of that time. The only two misses I can think of are Toei Spider-Man and Dengeki Sentai Change Man. In case you're new here, I've reviewed Toei Spider-Man before. It's up on my channel. Go check it out if you want. But Change Man... I don't recall liking it the first time I watched it. But as of recording this, I may give it another chance in the future. I'm not promising it's going to be anytime soon, but in the future, maybe if I feel like it. But for today... We're talking about Kamen Rider Super One. Starting off with the movie, since I plan on reviewing the show, hopefully by next month. And so, uh, first off, right now, with Super One, I have not entirely finished the show. Heck, I was originally planning to review it before, but wasn't fully subbed. But, thankfully, it is now fully subbed. So, I'm going to watch it in its entirety, since for the moment... I don't have a, well, entire opinion of it, and I prefer to watch the entire show in its entirety to get a full opinion, so I just wouldn't say half of it wasn't good. So, with that said, let's dig into Kamen Rider Super 1, the movie... I don't ever talk about presentations in movies and shows. Like, for example, the montage of the opening while the theme song is playing. Mainly because I'm more substance over flash. Basically... I can care less about what's on the screen at the moment. I'm paying more attention to the song because it's the opening theme song to the show. I'd rather judge that than what I'm seeing, which will only be on my screen for like, I don't know, a minute or so while the rest of the show will be happening. It's, that's just me. But I really like this one. Still showing our protagonist riding on a motorcycle while images of the movie monsters are popping up to startle you, giving a sense of adventure. Woo! It's cool. The movie begins, oh, actually, on those monsters for the movie, the Hell Valley Five operatives, trained under the show's main villain, Terror Macro, to steal from an ancient village five ancient swords to summon an ancient Chinese war machine. That I just realized is in Japan. Luckily, the village people of the Yamabiko village can defend themselves. Let's talk about the monster designs in this movie, shall we? Okay, so particularly the Hell Valley Five. So there's Satan Hawk, Strong Bear, Hibindar, Zozongar, and Crazy Tiger. Design-wise, I kind of want to say I might favor Hibindar, if only because I can sort of imagine him, I can sort of imagine that design for a modern monster today. Only one. All the others are sort of dated, especially in a way, I guess, Strong Bear, sort of, maybe because of the wig. Oddly enough... Satan Hawk is a woman. I, like, I'm not kidding that. That's true. Satan Hawk is a woman. Like, 
Maybe in the monster form you can't tell, but yeah, it's a woman. But yeah, design wise, they're all I guess they're all not bad for the times. Hibindar is probably my favorite because it could if imagine seeing something like that in modern day. I think Hibindar is probably my favorite because it's potentially the least dated. The chief of the village wakes up his two children, Chie and Shinta, and tells them to gather the village children and get out of here with the five glitter stones to protect as they can counter the war machine. The Hell Valley Five obtain the swords they need to summon the war machine that the village people praise as a deity and holy fuck it's a dragon! With the dragon or I mean the flying dragon fortress, they burn down the village and kill the village people. Two supporting characters of the show, Benki and Master Genkai, martial artists of their own school, the sincere Shaolin arts, hear the disturbance and act on it. Our protagonist, Super One himself, named Kazuya Oki, faces the flying dragon fortress and gets pretty damn lucky by... This is one thing that I was planning on saving for the actual review, but I guess I should explain it here as well. Super One's arsenal is five sets of gloves called the Five Hands, and one of the Five Hands are a green colored pair of gloves called the Thermal Hands. And in both hands, or at least one for each element, in one hand he can shoot out fire, and in the other hand he can shoot out ice. And with the ice-powered side of the thermal hands, he freezes the flying dragon fortress while it's in the air, getting great range to actually do the job. Which is pretty damn awesome, all things considered. It stops the bad guys for now, but not for long. And Kazuya soon unknowingly meets one of the kids from the village named Shinta, but that's on hold as Kazuya gets the lowdown. And Dogma's part in this, by the way, is just to build a new central base for when they take over Japan. Another thing I'll explain when I get to the show. Back to one of the village children, Shinta, him and Ryo, another supporting character from the show, are accosted by bullies with bats because children are assholes. Kazuya, however, is observant enough to get that he found what he was looking for, and the Mataki children all gather together, and to avoid anything that would thwart Dogma's plan, the Hell Valley Five are ordered to steal the five glitter stones. I'll say this, the fight choreography in this movie is awesome. The martial arts being performed is on point, and, the, and from the adults to the kids, who are pulling off ninjutsu by the way, Hell yes. Honestly, there are like two moments of fighting in this movie that are my favorite. One is the staff fight between Kazuya and Benki, and the other is when we see Chie pulling off martial arts moves. That is just awesome. I love it. Kazuya eventually starts facing the Hell Valley Five, starting with Satan Hawk and kills Hibindar. Satan Hawk soon steps in, but as soon as she takes a side to the head, she leaves, because that side was thrown by Master Genkai. And in this movie, Master Genkai wants all the smoke. The village kids in Rio are eventually discovered by Dogma, and as they hold Rio for ransom, for exactly four seconds until Super One ruins that exchange. And now, now I'm just going to touch on another thing. It's so amazing how I like the effects in a tokusatsu movie from the 80s because the next monster Super One kills is Crazy Tiger and he kills him by Crazy Tiger throws his spear at Super One. Super One catches it, then takes his spear and throws it right back at him and kills him by impaling him. What amazes me, I think, is just how long that lasts. Like, Super One catches his spear, he throws it, 
like tiger like crazy tiger it's thrown into the direction of his mouth and that's what kills him but he doesn't even take a moment to realize that he's been impaled he just explodes immediately like instant death it just i don't know why that just surprises me because i don't know maybe they're thinking about the runtime or something the point is dude just died immediately without having a moment to realize that then again in terms of any death at all that's the most realistic thing that's the most realistic example i'm trying to find the words too it's the closest thing to a realistic death in this movie that we'll get because spirits of the mouth boom killed immediately <laughs> Moving on. Ew. Dogma catches up to the children again as they try to outrun the Flying Dragon Fortress. They don't make it, and two people get captured again, only for Super One to save them in two seconds. So now, the Flying Dragon Fortress fires at Super One, although the last time that happened, he took it on, and he was quite successful. Anywho, the kids and the adults soon reach the spot where they could stop the fortress with the stones, and they're stopped yet again, but this time by Strong Bear. Remember when I said that Master Genkai wanted all the smoke in this movie? Well, he did, and he kills Strong Bear by himself, a non- writer kills a bad guy without any superpowers except the ability to do this badass like, the kids insert the stones into the wall that'll project the power to bring down the ship, and said action happens. And doesn't really do much since, spoiler alert, Super One destroys the ship later. Back with Super One, he's outnumbered by a bunch of old monsters. You'd think he'd try to run over some since he's on a motorcycle. But, now... Wait, who's missing? Had to do it. I'm running a load of laundry that I forgot to do earlier. And now, the previous eight writers kicking ass together. And it's glorious. It's a freaking brawl out of common writers and monsters getting fucked over and exploding, and I love it. And to top it off is the music in the background, a song which I struggled to find online, and thank god I did because this music is fantastic. Listing off everyone from Ichigo up to the current Super One, and the melody, lyrics, I just really love this song. And the fact that it's along with a great fight happening right now, brilliance. Just brilliant. Super One faces the fortress and freezes it again, because clearly no one thought to learn from that last time, despite it happening a couple of hours ago. And... Now we get crazy. Super One flies on his motorcycle into the fortress. 
I was going to call out and compare how the Thermal Hand's great range was plausible with this because as far as I know, Super One never uses his bike to fly again. And this movie's place in continuity is debatable. I'm not even too sure about where it lands in continuity. But it turns out, yeah, flying is a built-in feature. And Super One beats the last two monsters, and that's that. And before Genkai says that the Sincere Temple will take in the now orphans, Super One just says this. Yeah, I don't know why he says that speech either. Let's just have one more cameo of the writers. We'll see you again for Black RX. Story for another time. Overall, this movie is amazing. No, seriously, this movie is fantastic. I was walking into it expecting an average plot show a Kamen Rider movie, but this was actually pretty good. The action and choreography is timeless. The plot's not stale. And hey, there are child actors in this movie that actually have a bearing to the story. They're not just, well, in a nuisance. Everything with this movie has no flaws. Well, at least none of which I can think of. And I really like it. Go watch this movie. It is a really good movie, especially for something from Showa Common Writer. A lot of a lot of people think that the Showa era is just too old for anything, but I respectfully disagree. Remember, or at least this is something I'm saying now, one of my personal favorite reviews and one of my personal favorite shows from the Showa era is Kamen Rider Black. So if Black's good, I would definitely give the show and this movie a try. The show, I might, well, at least right now, give the movie a try. The show, we will see once we get to it next month. But with that said, thank you guys for watching. Please do not forget to like, subscribe, share this video, and tell your friends about Comrade or Black Man. And hopefully we get to look at more from the Showa era. And see you guys next time.